All right, 99.9 Punk World Radio FM. You guys already know what time it is. And right here, we are actually live on Facebook, YouTube, and of course, the radio station airwaves as well. As well. And we have legendary member of Dagger Mouth, Rest Easy, and of course, the real Mackenzie's. And also, he is a an amazing, talented, Canadian, legendary wrestler. This individual is a jack of all trades. We got Kenny Lush right here, live on the radio, man. How are you actually doing this evening? I'm good, man. Uh, I'm just up at my parents' place up north in uh, 100 Mile House, British Columbia. And uh, yeah, they got Wi-Fi, something that we didn't have in the 90s growing up here. So it's it's nice. I'm just sitting downstairs and in one of the spare bedrooms. This is actually my sister's room way back in the day. And uh, yeah, it's good to chat. Hey, man, it's good to chat with you as well. And it's also probably great to see family as well before you actually go on tour. And I think less, I think just a little over a month, you're going to be going all over, all over the United Kingdom. I go, I got five weeks, no UK dates, but uh, five weeks all over Europe. And I leave not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, I believe. So, yeah. But, but Kenny, I know you're a very busy individual, man. So I'm not going to take you away too, too much of your evening, but... I got to take you back to the year of 2004, where <laughs> you were the iconic band Daggermouth actually emerged into the scene. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us the beginnings of this band. And of course, how did you actually get connected and meet the other members? So Stu, I knew Stu just from uh, the music scene. And, uh, you know, he was like, I kind of think everyone in like their like late teens, 20s has like a Stu in their group where it's like, the guy's incredibly musically talented, but also like an extreme weed head. And he, you know, it, uh, he, he changes his mind and he's very sporadic. And, uh, but yeah, he was playing in like a kind of like a Lexus on fire type screamo band. Uh, they were called End This Week with Knives. And, um, I was just working one day, I was working at A and B Sound. I don't know. Are you Canadian? I'm Canadian. Yeah. We're actually located in Prescott, Ontario. Oh, okay, yeah, there's, there was like in the, in the, they probably closed in the early, mid 2000s, but uh, probably around 2006, they closed, but there was a chain, uh, like a music store called A&B Sound, and I was working in the shipping department, um, you know, just dragging TVs out to places and shit like that, and blah, 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 and anyways, make a long story short, Stu uh, showed up to the window while I was working, he's like, you want to start like a skate punk band? Everyone's just doing like screamo right now. And, you know, it was like the early 2000s. So everything was, you know, white studded belts and all that shit. Right. And he just wanted to start like, he was like, let's start a band that's like lag wagon or something. And I was like, hell yeah, I'm down. So, uh, yeah, we ended up starting dagger mouth and, uh, we didn't, we, we got our buddy Dana and Dana actually, he played on Stallone. And uh, he plays in my other band, Rest Easy, still. Uh, he's a great bass player. Uh, so he played bass, but he was really young at the time. Like, I don't even think, I think he was 17 or 18 and, like, dropped out of school to do this band <laughs> and shit. And, but, uh, yeah, so we had Dana playing. And then um, we had my buddy JJ was our first drummer. And he drums on Stallone, too. And then we had uh, our friend... Oh fuck! Ron Lowe was singing, and because uh, his old band Sunset on Broadway just broke up, but we did a couple shows with Ron, but never any recordings or anything, and it just didn't fit. And, and then we, uh, I was hanging out with Nick, the uh, original Dagger Mouse singer, and I was just like, "Come out and sing, try this shit out," because me and Nick were always talking about starting a band. So he came out and killed it, and the rest is history. <laughs> And when you said a few moments ago about Dana being 17 or 18, obviously, you know, even here in Canada, age majority to actually drink and be in clubs and bars is 19 years old. So at the very beginning of Dagger Mouth, did it actually, did you guys run into any issues with trying to get uh, Dana actually into the clubs or anything like that? Or did you, or did he just walk in like he owned the place? I think he just walked in. By the time we were like gigging, I, I think he was not just 19 or something like that. So I think... I don't remember it ever being an issue, but, you know, I, I know what you mean. I've been a bouncer at a club and sometimes like the opener band has a young kid in it and they have to like have a bracelet and come in the back door right onto the stage play and then get out of there. 
So <laughs> I, I don't know if that happened or not. I can't recall, but it possibly could have. That, that would that would have sucked though. If, if it did happen, I definitely feel I feel uh, Dana's pain. You know, all the other guys yeah. get to go party after the show, and he has to stand outside of the rain, looking through the window. Yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> <laughs> but also as well, uh, July two thousand five, you guys actually signed to a uh, Feeding Frenzy Records. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about this record deal. And of course, how did you guys? How did they actually end up discovering you guys originally? So we signed, I don't know, I wouldn't call it signed or anything, but uh, we were we were playing shows in Seattle and there was like a little punk house in Tacoma, I believe at the time. And one of the kids that lived in that punk house decided, his, I think his name was Derek, but he decided to um, like start a label. So he's like, I want your band to be first, the first band. And you know, like we're just a small band. We're like, Oh sweet. So like we went and recorded. Stu is actually, uh, uh, you know, he used to have a studio and stuff like that. So he just recorded us. So we, we went in and, uh, just recorded Stallone and basically gave it to this Derek guy. And this Derek guy took all the pre-sales and never sent any albums out to anyone and all that stuff so it was basically like he ditched town and moved out on his roommates and everything and last i heard and this was fuck probably 10 15 years ago that he was like a dj or some shit now or something like that but uh <laughs> but yeah he took off somewhere else in the states and just left like a couple boxes of albums and you know which the roommates gave us and you know Every couple days, someone would email us like, hey, we got ripped off on our pre-orders. So we had to like spend our own money sending the pre-orders out to people and everything. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. It's kind of, that's a common thread in like the the history of Daggermouth. <laughs> like us, like people just fuck at us and us tried really hard and then nothing ever happens. But uh, yeah, so he, that guy fucked off. And anyways, dude, did someone else reprint it? Like that state of mind records came around. Um, they were like a label based out in New York and they were like, Oh, we'll repress it and we want to do your next album. So yeah, so we ended up getting it re once we sold all those feeding frenzy copies, yeah, we moved on to state of mind and started selling theirs. And also as well, one of the last uh, Dagger Mouth questions I do have before we move on to the, your other ventures, on March 13th of 2007, you guys actually released my personal favorite album by you, which was actually Turf Wars. I was wondering if you could actually just tell us the story behind this amazing album. And of course, like, is it actually still available to be uh, purchased or even streamed to today in 2023? Oh, yeah. All our shit's on, um, like... I, I got all the rights back. Like when we did our reunion thing in 2018, um, I, I ended up writing a label uh, that we were on state of mind. And I was like, yo, I want all the rights. Like I'm going to put the, you know, I want all the stuff back. I'm going to put it up online myself and blah, blah, blah. And the guy wrote back and was like, absolutely not. And then I was like, okay, well, we've never seen any royalties from you. I'm going to start looking into this. And then he basically said, as long as, as long as uh, you don't come looking at us, I'll sign you the <laughs> royalties <laughs> over. So, so yeah, so we got the royalties back. That well, we got he didn't give us any royalties, but he gave he took all the shit down. And I put it back up, but uh, yeah, I'll, fuck, I'm amazed you know the dates. It must be on Wikipedia or something, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I it, it was it was a fun time, like. I, re I remember we had a lot of like hype behind us at the time and uh stallone was still like we we're trying to find our sound like there's quirky moments in it like because there was moments in this band when we first started where we were like let's sound like taking back sunday oh let's sound like monine let's sound like you know like stallone's definitely like a more quirkier album whereas turf wars i think that's where we like really bit down on like the easy core whatever you want to call it you know like the the melodic hardcore type stuff and we were also listening to at that point we were strictly like basically like even though we were a popular band we were just playing like with hardcore bands and the hardcore scene in north america really took us in and you know we'd 
like we would play with we'd play with mad ball we'd play with death before dishonor we'd play with final fight and you know a bunch of rivalry record bands down in la and the bay area and stuff like that so i think just playing in that scene kind of influenced us to definitely do like a you know just a bit more straight ahead you know turf war still has kind of some quirky little dance parts in it and stuff like that but uh yeah that album we just kind of went more straight ahead and i gotta say my favorite song is actually hey nelson go jump on go jump on the garage man what the whole oh, album is phenomenal but like if i had to choose just one to, to, to start the album off with i gotta say definitely nelson yeah that was always a, a favorite of mine to play too i like the beginning part it's all bouncy and fun and yeah <laughs> And also, I know you mentioned this briefly earlier on in the interview about how yourself and Dana actually formed another band uh, by the name of uh, Rastesia. But I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about that band. And of course, what actually made you both decide to actually launch that band together? So that band was uh, um, kind of started with between me and uh, the drummer Jimmy, who he used to play in a band called Shook Ones who's they're awesome they actually i just saw them play on in friday in seattle and they don't play often they play like once every couple of years or something like that and uh but yeah they're an awesome band and jimmy used to play in them and he was living in he like he has since he's originally from philadelphia he moved to alberta got married and everything and uh, he was kind of talking to me for a while about you know we should do a band we should do a band but you know he lives far away and this is kind of right at the time the Daggermouth reunion was petering out. And, and uh, you know, the drummer from Daggermouth lives in Winnipeg. Like, none of the drummers in my bands live anywhere near me. So, you know, it's kind of like, ah, I don't want to start something with someone that lives far away. And he's like, oh, we'll just do it all online. It's really easy. And, you know, so, yeah, we started just, like, sending riffs and drum tracks back and forth and all that. And. Yeah, that's kind of how that band came about. And I asked Dana if he wanted to be in it right away, and he was he was stoked. And Dana actually writes, uh, you know, between him and uh, the singer Dylan, like they both kind of they're about fifty fifty for lyrics and stuff like that. So Dana does contribute a lot in like the lyric department and stuff, which is great. And it's really cool how technology works as well, and just how you guys can be all in separate locations, even in different provinces or even different cities. And you guys can just like send files back and forth, and you can still put together an album that sounds like you guys were all together recording it. Yeah, and uh, like when we did the album, we finally like went into a studio. Jimmy came out, and we all went into a studio and stuff. But um, yeah, it was, it was it was good. I don't know, like because with Daggermouth, we would legit practice five nights a week. Like it was our jam, you know, like, and we were, pra we were doing late night practices too. Cause Stu, we practiced at Stu's studio and you know, the last people kind of left there around midnight or something. Right. So we would practice like midnight to three, five days a week, you know? So it's, I, I couldn't imagine doing that ever again. <laughs> and uh, as a grown up adult, it's, it's nice just to like get home from work, get, you know, have dinner and then just turn the computer on and, work on music that way so yeah it's been nice and it's been nice trying to figure out this garage band shit i'm still an idiot with it but i'm trying to my hardest to figure all this stuff out and i just bought this new plug-in the other day i can't figure out how to fucking make it work for the life of me <laughs> <laughs> honestly don't feel bad man there's even even with some of my dj equipment man like just stuff is evolving at such a fast rate that if i stick with one piece of equipment for like maybe two years something new comes out and i'm like wait what, what yeah, is this? Totally. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but also as well man i uh, uh, speaking of rest easy on october 28th of 2022 you guys actually released the phenomenal 12 track guy uh, album uh, titled hope you're okay i was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about this album and of course where can we actually snag ourselves a copy of it today uh, it's, it's all like the, the Spotify's and all that stuff. But if, if you want to buy an actual copy, uh, the easiest way would probably be Mutant League Records, um, uh, our record label out of Chicago. Um, the guy that runs that's been great and everything, and he's actually been awesome. So, uh, 
yeah, you can buy it there. And yeah, I'm really, I'm really proud on it. Like, uh, you know, we put a seven inch out before that too. That was really good. So yeah, I'm just hoping, hoping we can keep writing good music and, uh, you know, hopefully get some shows thrown our way. We don't play that much, but we're also very lazy. I'm so lazy now. I can't book tours and shit anymore. I'm, I just wait and see what gets thrown our way. <laughs> and I gotta say, you you I, you guys have actually earned the right to do that, man, because you guys put in your put in the work for so many years. So you guys deserve the right to actually be able to put your feet up and just let the opportunities come to you rather than actually try and make the moves. You guys already made the moves. Now you guys deserve to just have them like thrown at you. Yeah, we're vets, you know, like uh we're like Ric Flair of the pop punk world, you know, you gotta you know, we're royalty. <laughs> <laughs> and also as well, going in, obviously speaking of like Ric Flair and wrestling, uh, I was wondering as well, because obviously you've been doing, you've been for 20 plus years, you've been a professional wrestler. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about that aspect of your career. And of course, like what actually originally got you into wrestling and wanting to be, wanting to become a, uh, sorry, a professional wrestler. Um, well, I was a big fan of it growing up through the 80s and then, you know, like all the Hulk Hogan stuff and everything. And then I kind of really got out of it in the mid, like the early to mid 90s when it was like garbage, you know, like WWE had like, you know, the Repo Man and Man Mountain Rock and the Goon, like that period where every wrestler had to have like a day job. So, when Diesel was champion, just saying garbage, unfortunately. Nothing on Kevin Nash, but his uh, reign as champion was just... Yeah, yeah. I can't shit Kevin Nash too much. I actually uh, follow him on Twitter and his his politics, you know, he likes to give it to the Trump once in a while, so I, I can <laughs> I give him props <laughs> for that. So, uh, But yeah, I, I was always a fan, and uh, one day I was in high school and they had one of those like career and personal planning electives that I had to take and I don't know how they think any kid who's like 17 or 18 knows what he wants to do with the rest of his life but I was always class clown so I was like I want to be a wrestler and my teacher at the time was just like well they gotta figure they gotta come from somewhere figure write a report on where they come out and like how to be a wrestler and and uh, at that time I was reading Mick Foley's book so I kind of had like a little insight into the behind the scenes of it and yeah i just started like cold calling i there was a local company called the eccw who are now out of business but uh there was a company in town that i used to go see all their all their shows and uh and and you know so i talked to gorgeous michelle star about training with him and blah 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 and i didn't end up training with him i ended up getting trained by a guy named the rocket randy tyler and a little bit of my training was done with uh, Luther, who's in AEW right now. So, uh, you know, but mostly it was Rock Randy Tyler and a guy named my Iron Mike Roselli that trained me up. And, you know, so I trained in 99 when I was 19 years old and did that for a couple of years, just like small, local, like almost backyard wrestling type shit, you know, and then and then Daggermouth got busy. So I stopped wrestling altogether. I didn't even really follow it for a long time. And then I started getting back into it and reading all the wrestling books while I was on tour. And uh, I started really getting into like Japanese wrestling too at that point, like uh, pro wrestling Noah at that time. I really, really, really liked. And when the band broke up, I was just like, I was out of shape. I'm out of shape now. But, uh, you know, back when the when the band broke up, I was just like, fuck, I still you know, I'm young. I still want to travel around the world, but I don't, I don't want to do it with four or five dudes right now. So yeah, I just, you know, went back home, started working out and, you know, plus it's like you're, you know, my band, my baby broke up. I needed something to take my attention off of it too. Right. So yeah, I started working out and a couple minutes or, you know, a couple months later I had a needle in my butt with some steroids and I started getting bigger and bigger and yeah, just, uh, went to uh went to an eccw show and just kind of say hey i'm looking to get back into wrestling and you know most of the people didn't even recognize me there but i found out they had a training school and i just started going out there and you know shaking off the cobwebs and stuff and yeah one thing led to another and you know even uh even when i first 
got back into wrestling, I was still like, I was really motivated. Like I was doing the Harley race camp down in St. or Elton, Missouri. And, uh, from there, I was lucky enough. Well, I was at that camp. My buddy wrote me about a tour to Korea. So through there, I've managed to tour Korea five or six times. And I did two tours pro wrestling of Japan which was uh, awesome. And I've wrestled in Ireland and a bunch of places. So yeah, it's, you know, but, you know, kind of once that dagger mouth reunion hit, I was kind of like, ah, you know, maybe my time wrestling's done. And then I still wrestled a little bit and then COVID hit. And I was just like, man, I'm 40. This could go on for a few years, which it did. And now I'm 43 and I'm just like, the chance of me getting signed anywhere is like, not happening you know what i mean i could still do the local stuff if i wanted to but to be honest i'd much rather spend my time with my wife and my dogs or playing guitar or something like that than than you know involving myself with the local wrestling scene i gotta say as well man like i i definitely hear what you're saying but never say never for instance look at that diamond dallas page i think he was i think he first became pro and actually got into wcw when he was in his mid-40s as well but you know yeah, we'll see. I uh, fuck. You know, he got he got involved because he he fucking ran a strip joint, and all the boys were excited to go to his strip joint, right? So I don't know. I think if I think if anyone wanted forty five year old Kenny to get in the ring, they'd probably want their money back. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Touche on that one, Kenny. Touche. Although there is a lot of no good young guys coming out of the area that uh, that I'd love to wrestle. So like. uh you know, give a shout out to my to my buddy. Uh, I used to wrestle with his father, actually. Um, but my friend Nick Wayne just had his debut. He's fresh out of high school and fucking already signed with AEW. And he had his first match in AEW. So I'm really stoked for him. And there's just a, there's a lot of there's a lot of great wrestlers right now in, in the Pacific Northwest. Way more better wrestlers than when I was around. So, you know. The scene's doing good. It'll survive without me, you know. And before we move off the topic of your wrestling, I do know as well that I remember watching you a uh, few matches that you had actually in uh, the amazing promotion before Tony Rob bought it out, obviously, called Ring of Honor, where you actually had the opportunity to wrestle in 2015 at the uh, Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling Global Wars. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about that. And of course, like, what was it like just working at Ring of Honor? Because in my honest opinion, I really like the original ring of honor i don't mind what tony khan has done to it but i just love the old ballroom feel that roh originally had yeah and i you know i was i feel like when i was in ring of honor there was still a bit of a change going on like it was kind of you know like it wasn't the ring of honor of like the old samoa joe and all that shit and you know, but they they had TV and stuff, and they were kind of the next biggest thing in North America to to WWE at the time. So, you know, it's cool. My my buddy Kyle, who was originally from Vancouver, Kyle O'Reilly, he he uh, he was signed to Ring of Honor, and he just started to tell me, like, "Yo, we got this new Japan thing like coming up. Like, just hop in the car with me, and you know." So I'd fly to St. Louis, wherever he was living at the time, and you know, just hop in the car and bring them around and meet all the guys and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I guess, I guess the office and the, the workers liked me enough to, you know, I was lucky. I got on a couple, couple dark matches, you know, in Vegas, I did a match for TV taping and stuff like that. I even did uh one or two of those ring of honor camps, which was a good time. It was, it was just a great time in my life, you know, hanging out with cop, like my buddy Kyle and, doing those matches and stuff. And at one point they actually did talk to me a little bit about a, a kind of beginner entrance contract. And I was like, Oh man, this is it. I made it like, you know, and then it was like, can you move out East? Like, I was like, yeah, I can like move to Toronto. No problem. Like, you know, or if you get me my work visa, like I, I can move wherever. And then I found out like, they were talking about paying me like 10 grand a year. And I was like, that's a hard sell to my wife to like get up and move <laughs> for her to quit her job and everything just so I can fucking wrestle for a ring of honor. So, and she hates the wrestling. So, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> did, did, did you ever try? Did you think of that? So I'm guessing right then and there you were like, yeah, I can't do it. Like, did you talk to her about it or were you just like, you know what? I just can't do it. Because I mean, 10 grand, I mean, to get you to really move, I think 10 grand should have gave you a heck of a lot more, man, because you really are a talented, talented wrestler, man. They should at least gave you 50 to 60K. Oh, thanks, man. Like, yeah, and I'd still be able to probably do indies and make money off that shit, but. I don't know. Like my main goal at the, at the time with all that stuff is I really wanted to get into New Japan. I remember trying to trying to get into there, and before there, I was bugging Noah a whole bunch. And and uh, actually, pro wrestling Noah came out to the Harley Race camp, and they were talking about tagging me up with another guy that they had at that camp. And uh, that other guy was just like, I can't afford to go live in the dojos in japan and blah 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 almost the same thing why i couldn't do the ring of honor thing right he's just like i got a family blah 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 and, you know so you know my goal since i lived on the west coast my goal in my perfect world is i would have loved a new japan contract or a pro wrestling noah contract and then you know you'd fly your nine hours direct flight or eight hours direct flight land in tokyo do your few weeks tour make your money and come home which, you know, that'd be awesome. But yeah, it just never worked out. But, you know, there's always always something around the corner, too. <laughs> and speaking of flying as well, man, this summer, Rest Easy is actually going to be on tour uh, with uh, Choke and Good Rittens. I was wondering, what cities do you actually, do you guys plan on hitting? And of course, where can we actually snag ourselves some tickets to come out and see you guys live in full effect? We're doing the. We're doing the Vancouver show and then the Alberta shows. So, um, yeah, if you want tickets to the Vancouver one, just go to rickshawtheater.com and probably grab them there. And then uh, the Alberta shows, the Edmonton one's at the Buckingham, so you can probably grab tickets there. And then the other one's at a new club in Calgary called uh, Modern Love. So I'm stoked to check that out. I have some buddies involved with opening that up and stuff, so it'll be good to play those. and. Yeah, it was just kind of nice to, you know, finally get offered a good, like, little support run and stuff. We were supposed to go out with Lagwagon in May, and two days before the tour, it was canceled because Joey Cape had, uh, had a medical problem. So, uh, yeah, so we were kind of bummed on that, but then this good rinse thing came around. So, you know, it's always, you know, I landed on my feet. I'm stoked. <laughs> <laughs> And I hope whenever Joey actually gets back on his feet, I really hope that that tour gets uh, gets kind of like uh, rebooked and you guys actually get on that as well. Yeah, me too, because that'd be fucking great. Legwagon is one of my favorite bands, but Good Riddance is also one of my favorite bands. I actually learned how to play guitar to Legwagon and Good Riddance guitar tabs in the 90s. So, so it's cool to play with them since kind of that's how I learned to play guitar. <laughs> And obviously, aside from the summer tour coming up, I was wondering what is next for yourself, and of course, the the rest of the groups that you are a part of. Because I do know you are a part of the Real Mackenzies as well. But I do know we talked about everything that you've done throughout your career. We'd probably be here to the early morning hours of tomorrow. So, yeah, but yeah. is there anything we happen to miss during this evening's interview that you still want to touch on, talk about, or promote? Um, shit, I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, the Mackenzies go out. Uh, five weeks in Europe coming up next week. Um, yeah, and that was kind of during the pandemic. That was kind of the one thing that kind of came out of it that was pretty cool. Was uh, I was I uh, while the bar while the bars were open there, like you know how like they would open shit up again for a month or two and then close it again. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. So I and a plexiglass with a nightmare as well. Yeah. So yeah. Oh man. That's that was the end of it for bouncing for me too. I had I had people like, yo, I gotta scan your like vaccine pass things, and people saying I'm a fucking drinking children's blood. I have QAnon fucking people yelling <laughs> at me and shit. And you know, oh you support the World Economic Forum or some bullshit. I don't know, fucking idiots, but uh, you know led to me thumping a few of them out and i was like man my temper is getting pretty bad i better start bounce i better stop bouncing but mario uh who's in the mckenzie's 
he actually was uh he he works backstage for concerts and stuff and he was working at the rickshaw and he was just coming through and i was like hey man i heard you're back in the mckenzie's like if you ever need a fill-in guitar player or something for a local show let me know like i'd be stoked to you know help you out you know he's an old friend of mine from the like mid 90s and he just called me two weeks later and was like you just want in the band and i was like eh, sure like you know they were like they were never my like favorite fat band to be honest and stuff and i'm not a huge fan into the of the celtic kind of rock dropkick murphy's <coughs> excuse me type stuff but uh you know but they've really grown on me and it's been a great opportunity to see the world and you know like being a wrestler if you're a wrestler you want to just tour japan and if you're a musician you just want to tour europe so it's it's been awesome like getting to go to europe every few months with the mckenzie's you coming in come on baby sorry i had to let my chihuahua in. oh it's but, all good yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's 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 been good um if i have to hype anything else I would say if you have kids, there's a movie on Netflix called The Main Event. It's a WWE movie, and uh, you could see me in that, and I do stunts in there and everything. So, and I'm one of the uh, wrestlers in the tournament. So I always, I'm pretty stoked on that. I always tell people, kids, to watch that movie. <laughs> but yeah, that's about it to plug. You can, uh, yeah, come see the McKenzies. Come see Rest Easy. And uh, go to Mutant League Records and buy some of our stuff. We also have a band camp, too. If you live in Canada, we don't sell the full length on there. But uh, if you go to Rest Easy Punks, Punks with an X, because we're punks. So go to resteasypunks.bandcamp.com. And we got, like, shirts and seven inches and shit if anyone wants to buy anything. And obviously, Kenny, I know how to follow you on social media. But for the individuals that aren't that social media savvy... And want to follow you guys and the rest of your bands. How do they actually go about searching you and actually following you on all social media platforms? I think all the Dagger Mouse stuffs under like Dagger Mouse six hundred four. The rest easy stuffs all rest easy punks. Um, on on Facebook and and uh, Instagram and that. My old my personal shits all Kenneth A Lush. And uh, I opened up a Threads account too. I don't know if uh, if anyone can tell me how to use that fucking thing. So I can close Twitter. That would rock. But I'm also Kenneth A. Lush on Twitter. And uh, the real Mackenzies, it should be easy enough to find them. They're on Fat Records. <laughs> and I got to say as well, I, I joined Threads as well. I, I think it's kind of like Twitter as well, but I'm, I still joined it. And I'm like, what the hell do I do with this? Yeah, I have no idea because I log on it and it's still just posts from people I don't follow. I'm like, who the fuck? Like, I don't know. I think everyone should do better just throwing their phones in the ocean for a little bit. I actually heard something supposedly that NASA predicts that the internet's going to go down for about three months. I really hope it happens. I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, I wouldn't be able to do the radio thing for a while, but I think it'd be good for us human beings to rejuvenate and kind of get back to the old ways. Yeah, and you could do you get like a trucker radio or something, you know, like an old school <laughs> when you watch The Walking Dead and they have like those old CB radios, you, you get one of those. That's actually that, that's actually pretty a pretty <laughs> damn good idea. Have a uh, turn punk world radio into a trucking CB station for three months until the grids go back up. <laughs> yeah, totally. That if it crashed for three months, it'd be crazy, but it would also be great. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, this new generation of uh, kids though, they 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 lose their damn mind. They probably go psycho, but. Us old yeah. folk will be sitting back being like, ah, man, just dust off the old VHS player and put in some old old school wrestling tapes. I'll be fine. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Watch some old NWA war games or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to say first and foremost, Kenny, thank you so much, man, for giving not only myself, but the radio station Airwaves a little bit of your time here this evening just to talk about your amazing career, not only within music, but also the wrestling industry as well. And I got to say as well, thank you for making kick-ass gnarly music, man. And of course, you know, stepping in that ring and actually putting your body on the line for fans like myself, man, you know, because at the end of the day, I know you do the wrestling for, for yourself and your own enjoyment as well. But at the end of the day, you're putting on a show for us fans. So thank you so much for putting your body on the line just to entertain us as well, man. We greatly appreciate that. Oh, thanks, man. No, anytime. 
I'm missing a bicep. I fucking have multiple concussion. My forehead's all fucked up, but you know, it, was, it was a fun journey. <laughs> But I, I, again, though, Kenny, thank you so much, man. I'm pretty sure down the line we definitely shall talk again soon. Definitely have yourself a kick-ass time in Europe. Definitely safe travels. But for now, we definitely shall talk again soon. Yeah, sounds good, man. Thank you so much. Hey, you're most certainly welcome, Kenny. Thank you so much. Have a, have a wonderful night. Yeah, you too. Have a good one, dude.